May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you on this Ash Wednesday. Will you pray with me? O oh God, maker of everything and judge of all that you have made from the dust of the earth, you have formed us, and from the dust of the earth you would raise us up by the redemptive power of the cross. Create in us clean hearts and put within us a new spirit that we may repent of our sins and lead lives worthy of your calling. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to share couple of passages of scripture with you. These are the ones that the lection has selected for Ash Wednesday. Our Old Testament lesson comes to us from the book of Joel, verses from the second chapter. Blow the horn in Zion, give a shout on my holy mountain. Let all the people of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and no light, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness spread out upon the mountains. A great and powerful army comes, unlike any that has ever come before them or will come after them in centuries ahead. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your hearts, with fasting, with weeping, and with sorrow. Tear your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, very patient, full of faithful love, and ready to forgive. Who knows whether he will have a change of heart and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the horn in Zion. Demand a fast. Request a special assembly, gather the people, prepare a holy meeting, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the groom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the porch and the altar, let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep. Let them say, have mercy, Lord, on your people, and don't make your inheritance a disgrace, an example of failure among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Matthew's Gospel, the sixth chapter, records these words of, of Jesus spoken to the people of God. Be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people to draw their attention. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may get praise from people. I assure you that's the only reward they'll get. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you may give to the poor in secret. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't be like hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you pray, go to your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. And when you fast, don't put on a sad face like the hypocrites. They distort their faces so people will know they are fasting. I assure you that they have their reward. When you fast, brush your hair and wash your face. Then you won't look like you are fasting to people, but only to your father who is present in that secret place. Your father who sees in secret will reward you. Stop collecting treasures for your own benefit on earth where moth and rust eat them and where thieves break in and steal them. Instead, collect treasures for yourselves in heaven where moth and rust don't eat them and where thieves don't break in and steal them. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of God. 
for the people of God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the sentiments of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, I'm going to going to do something that you know I've never done before. You get to see it. I'm going to preach with a hat on. Yes, sirree, Bob. I have here my very own hat. I bought it new. And it is start in a department store in Emmett, Idaho in 1973. It is a Stetson 3X Beaver. It is what could be described as the iconic cowboy hat. And I bought this hat at a, at a time when I was actually working for a rancher. I was. Cost me the better part of a week's wages. But, you know, I didn't work for that rancher as, as we normally think of, of, of cowboys working. You see, the entire time that I worked on that ranch, I never even climbed on a horse. In fact, truth is, I've spent very little time on a horse anywhere. And I've never in my life used a lasso to rope anything. You know, the entire time I, I worked for that rancher, well, about two, three years, summer times and weekends and stuff when I was in school, I basically did the jobs, did the jobs that the cowboys didn't want to do. I, I built and fixed fences. And while I did occasionally help with help them when they were working cattle, you know, at branding times, I did so strictly as a laborer, during those branding op operations, the cowboys would go out there on their horses and they would, would heel rope the calves. And then they'd bring them back to the branding site. And there I was, I was the one then who got to flip the calves onto their sides and I snubbed their head and the front foot through a down through a loop, staked out to the ground so that the cowboys who stayed on their horses the whole time could just simply back the horse up. They'd stretch the calves out and hold them there for whatever needed to be done. So yeah, I actually have worked on cattle ranch, but never as a cowboy. You know, I can wear this hat, and I can wear my fine-looking Tony Llama boots, and I can put on all that other stuff that we traditionally associate with cowboys, but those things won't make me a cowboy. I'm not a cowboy, and in all likelihood, I will never, ever be a cowboy. One actually has to do the work of a cowboy to truly fill that role. I'm not a cowboy. Shouldn't pretend to be one. You know, there's, there's a saying that you might have heard before. All hat and no cattle. It's supposed to have Texas origins, and that sounds about right. It's basically used to describe a person whose external appearance or whose words lay claim to them being something that they are actually not. And, you know, we've probably all seen people who have pretended to be somehow more than they actually were or, or even something that they were not, who were, in essence, all hat, no cat. I strongly suspect that very few, if any of us, have ever been really impressed by those pretentious persons. The real person, what a person actually does, you see, that's what really matters. Not the external, superficial trappings that, that we might put on display in order to impress the people around us. And I bring up this point on this Ash Wednesday for a reason. You know, as people who, who claim the name Christian, who profess to believe in and who, who profess to follow our Lord Jesus Christ, you and I, we need to take a good, good hard look at our lives and earnestly peer into our hearts. To what extent do we truly believe in our Lord Jesus Christ? To what extent do we earnestly seek to do as he commands us to do? And 
to what extent might our behavior be more like all hat and no cattle? Claiming the name Christian while leaning towards more of the self-centered, sinful inclinations of our hearts. How often, how often do we name, claim the name Christian while willfully doing those things that our God forbids us to do? And how often do we claim the name Christian while we, have, we refuse to do those things that our God tells us to do? How often do we willfully do those things that our God forbids us to do? How often do we refuse to do the things that our God tells us to do? How often do we harshly judge our neighbors for their sins that have offended us while at the same time minimizing, even ignoring our own sins? How often do we bask in God's unconditional forgiveness while at the same time coming up with our own reasons to avoid forgiving those who have hurt or offended us? How often do we even bother to acknowledge our sins? How much more often do we ignore them or, or do we pretend that our sins really don't matter? How often do we fool ourselves into to believing that we can do just fine all on our own, that we really don't need God's forgiveness because whatever we'll admit to doing that might not be so great isn't nearly as bad as what we claim our neighbors have done. How often can we actually bring ourselves to confess our utter inability to, to pay off our horrendous sin debt by our own efforts and earnestly come before God and humbly ask for the forgiveness that we all need. How often do we go there? How often is our faith life all hat and no cattle? And who do we think we're fooling? with our acts of self-righteous holiness. Truth is, our neighbors can spot our hypocrisy a mile off. And our God, who, who knows our innermost thoughts, certainly knows our true behavior as well as our deepest needs. You see, the truth was, it is, and it always will be, that our pretentious, self-righteous posturing fools no one but ourselves to our continued detriment. We, you and I, we are the ones that we hurt most when we ignore our sins and when we ignore our very real need for God's forgiveness and guidance. You know, the essential first step in solving a problem is to admit that the problem exists. And we've got a problem, you and I. Oh, yes, we do. We've got a huge problem that we can't solve all on our own. We need help. We all do. We need to call that reality up to the very forefront of our consciences and earnestly seek that help that we all need. You see, our scripture texts that I shared with you moments ago, they point to our need. Our need to reject the, the superficial and insincere trappings of, of, of pious behavior and to admit our sorry, sin-filled state to ourselves and to our God and to seek God's forgiveness. See, that's what God was, was talking about through the prophet Joel when he tells the people of God to return to me with all of your hearts, with fasting, with weeping, with sorrow. Tear your hearts. Not your clothing. We are told that we need to repent from the very core of who we are to earnestly strive to, to change our hearts and our lives rather than attempt to soothe our guilty consciences by, by merely adopting some outward showing of, of holiness. Jesus 
tells us repeatedly to, to turn to God with sincere hearts rather than trying to impress our, our neighbors with our outward displays of piety. Do you remember what he said? When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. I assure you that's the only reward they'll get. But when you pray, go to your room, shut the door, and pray to your father who is present in that secret place. Your father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. My brothers and sisters, we are what we are. You and I, all of us, every single one of us, without exception, are imperfect human beings. We are broken by our human sin and we are in desperate need of God's forgiveness and the aid that he has to offer us. So let us, let us set aside our pretense of being that which we are not. Let's set all of that aside. Let us be who we really are. Imperfect people, broken by sin, and in dire need of God's forgiveness. Let us admit our, our mistakes, our sins, and earnestly and humbly turn to our God. You know, our Old Testament lesson today that we read moments ago, calls for us to do this, just that. And it also tells us what's going to happen when we do that. Did you catch that part? God speaking to us today through scripture, through the sound of my voice right here, right now. He's speaking to us and he tells us to return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, very patient, full of faithful love, and ready to forgive. Brothers and sisters, let each of us make a renewed and sincere effort to, to change our hearts and our lives, to believe and to rely on the redeeming grace of our almighty God so that we can be saved from our sins, so that we can better be the people that our God calls us to be. Amen. You know, in our in-person worship services that are going to happen later on today. This message that I just shared with you, that's going to be followed by a responsive reading of the 51st Psalm for our prayer of confession and pardon. And I know that we can't really do a responsive reading in this video format since you don't have that scripture before you, but you can pray this song with me as I read it out loud. So now, my brothers and sisters, may... The almighty and merciful God who desires not the death of a sinner, but that we turn from wickedness and live, accept your repentance, forgive your sins, and restore you by the Holy Spirit to, to newness of life. Amen. Let us pray the 51st Psalm, verses 1 through 17 together. Have mercy on me, God, according to your faithful love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash me completely clean of my guilt. Purify me from my sin because I know my wrongdoings. My sin is always right in front of me. I've sinned against you, you alone. I've committed evil in your sight. That's why you are justified when you render your verdict. Completely correct when you issue your judgment. Yes, I was born in guilt and sin from the moment my mother conceived me. And yes, you want truth in the most hidden spaces. You teach me wisdom in the most secret place. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and celebration again. Let the bones you crushed rejoice once more. Hide your face from my sins, wipe away all my guilty deeds. Create a clean heart for me, God. Put a new faithful spirit deep inside me. Please don't throw me out of your presence. 
Please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Return the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach wrongdoers your ways and, and sinners will come back to you. Deliver me from violence, God, God of my salvation, so that my tongue can sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will proclaim your praise. You don't want sacrifices. If I gave an entirely burned offering, you wouldn't be pleased. A broken spirit is my sacrifice, God. You won't despise a heart, God, that is broken and crushed. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord raise up his countenance upon you and give you peace.